Um, so I'm a family doctor and a family doctor in Nelson and I've, uh, I've been up in Haida Gwaii and Sioux Lookout as well and trained in a big huge city in Toronto. Um, so all those pieces kind of come together and I also don't have one story. <laughs> That's the theme. Um, and so my process just coming here tonight was wondering what stories would come in and so I just offer you the stories that really just came to me as I thought of coming here tonight. And interestingly, the first one um, is a little Ojibwe boy um, who was mm, about one, one, two um, in a northern community in Ontario and um, was having seizures and in the nursing station and the nurses were doing the best that they could to support him. Um, and then as a resident, so a uh, doctor in training, um, I was asked to go on a medevac up to this boy to take this boy to Winnipeg. Um, and this boy was already needing support with uh, breathing from the nurses and it was at least three or four hours before I was going to be there. Um, and I was a family medicine resident. Um, and it was a very difficult plane ride, anticipating what I was coming to and what this really, really was. Um, I was being asked to come in and be very medical and continue airway management and transfer a baby. Um, but the baby really wasn't doing well when I got there and I knew somehow that, that I was caring for someone who was dying. Um, at that point, it was late at night by the time we had got in, and, and in any medevac in the north, when you're in the plane, you don't actually even know if you're necessarily going to land, because the pilots are told what, um, what the case is, they're just told where they have to go, and then they need to get the transport there safely, and, and if they shouldn't land, they shouldn't land. So we knew we had a sick child. Um, Pilots don't. They did land that plane, but they don't always, they can't always. Um, but from the nurse's point of view, they were very glad to have another set of hands, simple hands, learning hands. Um, and so we formulated a team instantly. We had to become a team and do the best we could for this child and then get on another plane and transport for, we had to wait for that to happen, but then transport for another two and a half hours. So this child was supported in limited way by the circumstances. Um, and, it, and I spent a lot of time just sitting and managing an airway and we, we didn't have a ventilator so we were bagging. Um, and just tried to find a space within myself to understand what we were doing. My wish and my heart was that the child could remain in his community with his family and die with respect there. The higher wishes were that the doctors would do something and that's what I was being asked to do. Um, by the time I got to the community, um, the family wasn't there anymore and I didn't understand that. It's in time that I understood the family had let go um, and we, the caregivers, were continuing what we perceived our job was. Um, so that's one vignette that dropped in. Another was um, a 30-year-old Ojibwe woman who was just sitting on Ward B in Sioux Lookout Hospital and waiting to be assessed uh, for a pregnancy. The, the um, women in that area fly down to have their deliveries in a hospital far away from their community. So she was alone um, and very quiet, very subdued. This was. She'd come into a place that was very foreign and so I had to engage her and um, get to know her very quickly. Um, and I had a very particular mantra of medical questions to ask and I reached one that was very significant that shifted everything and just asked her, and is your baby moving? No. And that's an unusual thing um, and I probed and probed and there's really no discussion or memory of movement for quite some time and so we went through a process of, of delivering that baby that that was not alive 
And so it's a different kind of palliative care. In fact, it was supporting a mom totally isolated from her community in a very foreign hospital to her um, delivering a baby that wasn't alive. Um, and how do you prepare yourself for that? This was very early days in my um, practice. Um, and each, each interaction is a learning. It, you just don't know beforehand. Um, then I think of um, a mother, a mother of three, um, who was dying of a melanoma, metastatic melanoma. Um, and I didn't meet her um, until I was asked to um, do some home visits to manage her pain. And I met her briefly when, when she was conscious and could speak to me. Um, just got a sense um, of her wishes. And then the rest of my care was um, really being in her family with her six-year-old and her husband and her teenage daughters and their coming and going and our supporting of pain and what their needs were and where this family was going. And again, learned so much. Uh, in that community, we didn't have home care. Home care nursing was really the eMERGE nurse who I just called up and said, can we set up some, some um, butterflies or intravenouses as needed. So a very different environment of creating a team with folks that you work with in eMERGE and then they transform because it's a small community and um, they're working in someone's home. Um, I thought of another friend um, in that community who had been very strong community member, um, leading change in education, leading change in um, uh, health food, and uh, had a diagnosis of cancer that really lasted nine months. Um, she didn't like uh, the medical world and kind of avoided it. She ha we happened to have our children in the same um, alternative school. It was a little kind of collective homeschooling. And so maybe I was okay, but, but going to do pap smears, uh, didn't want to do that. And so she presented with um, advanced cervical cancer, which is unusual in Canada, um, because we do have screening systems. Um, and uh, a very, very powerful death to be a witness of, because she had such a strong community that loved her and supported her, and her, her dying process was really over nine months and the pain did increase in the last uh, days almost almost like a birthing um, and in the last days she had a circle of women who'd stay with her all the time usually singing and chanting and we were in a hospital that um, is very used to just working with wherever people are at and what they want um, in that hospital as well, I, I thought of um, another example of, maybe you wouldn't call it palliative care, but it's definitely family, me family medicine and dying. Um, a big logging uh, accident where someone was, you know, a tree fell on them. And uh, amazing heroics of the first aid folk in the field again, you know, four or five hours by road away to support their colleague and bring them in to the medical people to support them. And um, we would carry on the resuscitation and then we were the ones who needed to make that decision to continue or not. And it was not appropriate to continue. Um, but by this time, everybody, the entire island knew. So the whole logging community and the whole Haida community were really surrounding the hospital. Um, and those closest were in the room, in the resuscitation room. Um, in, in bigger hospitals, the family is not always allowed to come into that resuscitation place. They're pushed out, but this, they were all there. Um, and that's, you're just growing all the time the more, the deeper that you 
are exposed to a whole community holding space for someone. Uh, and then the depth of debrief that that community went through involving a huge WCB process and involving all, all the people who'd been in the first aid in the field and the workers who'd helped get the first aid attendants to their buddy and um, then the caregivers in the hospital and the community members affected. So just a really impressive piece of WCB debriefing, bringing someone from the coast. The coast would be further down, like Vancouver, compared to Haida Gwaii. We were on the coast too. Um, and then I thought of, um, I thought of a gentleman who I looked after, uh, and he was a very resilient person, um, about 77 at the time, and had done everything well in the world, had succeeded at all, in all realms, and business and finance and family, very athletic, and had really fought his disease process um, with the best care possible, and certainly our internist, Dr. Malpass, was a part of that. Um, and, and kind of rose many times, like the Phoenix had, had, um, had against all odds, uh, recovered multiple times and the time that I met him was when there was a need for a family doctor and it was a time uh, where there was a recognition, slow recognition by the patient and perhaps slower by the family that maybe this time we needed to take a different approach and it, that can be very intimidating. I, I didn't have the solutions to to transform once again. I really was just waiting until the family was ready to um, look at things differently. And it's usually the patient who, who finds that place and asks, can you stop? Can you stop doing things? Can you stop taking blood? And, and I remember there was beautiful hospice care um, in that occasion. And I'm always impressed with the nurses on our floor who, um, Really, they do such breadth of work on the floor, and, and when they drop into palliative care, they drop into a very special place. Um, and the, whatever the team is, it, it just evolves. Um, the family that's there, the nurses that are there at that time, and um, if hospice is there, it's all, it's all wonderful. I'm always open to whoever wants to be a part of that. And I remember in that case, um, the it was very difficult for the wife to let go. So there's sometimes support of just the patient, but then the whole family or an individual that's struggling. And, and that case makes me think of another um, uh, where I think the I think 65-year-old gentleman, very rapid diagnosis of a, a malignancy, had been very healthy a month before, um, jogging in the weight room, very, very healthy. Um, and all of a sudden was very unwell. And uh, I think that he wanted to be at home, um, and that, that just wasn't possible for all those who would need to support that. It could have been possible in terms of um, home care nurses and hospice, but it, it wasn't possible for his wife. Um, and so how to find, how to create a beautiful environment in the hospital, how to quietly allow the puppies to come in and get tucked in a, in a coat and uh, come in and bounce on the bed. That, when I saw his face with those dogs, it's just beautiful and, and how he might be an example of someone who um, really uh, waited for people, really wanted to see uh, a niece who was on their way and waited for that niece to come, and it was a very special encounter, and waited for a friend who, who was a minister, who could just offer a support as a friend, but also as a spiritual person. Um, and, and then I, I remember um, this particular person was very, was very, he was really struggling uh, with an air hunger. It was very difficult to breathe, and yet there was still a vibrancy, and so we used, um, something called BiPAP, which is actually often used, uh, not or it's not used in palliative care in general, um, and 
sometimes as a caregiver, you actually have to fight the resistance of other caregivers who say, well, we can't use BiPAP. BiPAP is for acute people who are going to get better. And um, with enough coaxing, we got to a place where it was perfectly okay to use BiPAP to give this gentleman comfort. BiPAP is something that helps you breathe with pressure. Um, it's probably what one would do before an intubation. Um, and it, it helped this gentleman so much and allowed him to have the time he wanted to. I also remember with this particular gentleman that um, uh, one of the nurses commented, you know a person by, by their friends and in this case uh, his friends created a vigil where there was always someone with, uh, with him um, through the night and through the day and they just created their own pattern of how that would happen and again his, that wasn't something his wife could take on but his friends did. Um, and not uncommonly you meet um, other caregivers who are the friend, they're not the care, in their caregiver role, they're a friend. Um, and in this case, an, an older retired nurse was very supportive in that process. Um, and then uh, the story that came to me as we were speaking, so I feel I need to honor it as well, is my brother. Um, who was who passed away from colon cancer just in January, and um, he was a person who gave to the world um, as uh, someone who worked with youth workers, both on the ground where he lived in Rochester, and he supported youth workers all over um, the world over uh, 25 years of his work, and. Um, so not surprisingly, when he received a diagnosis of colon cancer, he um, built a team. He built teams all his life. And he really honored all the teams that he worked with through a diagnosis of cancer and chemotherapy. And, um, and I came to, I was at a distance. He was in Rochester and I was here. And I came to understand um, that over time, um, oh, it did surprise me, but uh, when I was at um, uh, a funeral for him, one of his um, nurses that had given chemo, um, sort of a two-weekly interval, came up to me in the middle of this gathering and said, I must tell you how much David gave to us. So each time he went to chemo, he brought something, something, something little for um, the people who were caring for him. He had a great honoring of nurse practitioners. His nurse practitioner really was his primary care um, support and was always on call and could always answer questions. He became great friends with um, his surgeon who uh, they had a mutual connection with um, a Jewish university that they both attended to, Yeshiva in New York City. And um, they had long talks about life, um, perhaps an unusual thing for a surgeon and some, a youth worker. Um, and then when it came to that point in his care where he'd been admitted for yet another time with a bowel obstruction um, and the surgeon wanted to go on and cure it or solve another problem or do another <coughs> procedure, um, David was in enormous pain and he used those skills he'd used all his life in working in teams and worked with his team of caregivers to support them to let go of having to do something um, and help him get to where he, needed, he knew he needed to be, which was hospice. And he did that with severe nausea and severe pain. I saw him the next day. Um, and uh, all I could describe was that uh, someone in distress. Um, and uh, he had negotiated his way out of that space and was allowed to get into hospice where they began to manage his pain consistently and not as needed. And he was a stoic person, he wasn't asking for anything. And they managed his nausea and they got him into a beautiful place um, a comfort and then he was able to um, live his last month 
um, with family visiting and surrounding and ultimately with his my mother his mother um, who's 85 um, she's never seen anyone die before she grew up in a small town in Scotland and um, and this was all new for her and yet I had visited uh, and had to return um, and my other brother had to return to his work um, and uh, David's wife um, had, had to go to do a piece of work that seemed uh, significant for what finances would um, be forthcoming in that year. His son uh, had needed to say goodbye, I couldn't stay in that hospice environment, and his daughter um, chose to support his, uh, his wife, her mom. So my mom was in the United States, um, doesn't drive, and just had to figure out what do you do when someone's dying. Um, and I spoke to her a lot on the phone, and I said, well, what did you do when he didn't, when he had a fever, when he was little? Just need to be present with him. Um, and there'll be people who will help you. Ask someone to drive you. Ask someone to help you find a hotel that's nearby. And so she did, and I think they spent a lot of time just being together. He wanted to get up and walk, really, till his, the day before he died and she would walk with him sort of 30 meters to a window. He wanted to sit by the window. And one of the things he said to her um, was, you know, Mom, you make a good team. Uh, so many journeys. Thank you, Martha.